In this presentation, dear friend, Francois will guide you through the ancient Babylon in Iraq, where Nebuchadnezzar ruled for many years. Archaeological discoveries reveal how Daniel's predictions were marvelously fulfilled. Yes, Babylon was destroyed. Saddam Hussein started to rebuild the city, but once again he was prevented to continue. Listen to the fascinating history. God allows nations to acquire power in order to rule righteously and uplift people. History reveals the fact that whenever a nation abuses its God-given privileges, its greatness vanishes. And this is exactly what happened to the ancient Assyrian Empire. They abused their God-given privileges and their glory vanished. In 689 BC, Sennacherib ruthlessly destroyed Babylon. The cruelty of this war can be seen on the war relief discovered by archaeologists in the ruins of his palace. And then shortly after this cruel war, he decided to invade Judah, and there he destroyed 46 cities. His main objective was, of course, to wipe Jerusalem from the face of the earth, but God prevented him from doing it. In 645 BC, the Assyrian king called Ashurbanipal attacked the city of Susa with his mighty army, and many innocent people were destroyed. As I walked across the ruins of this ancient Elamite capital of Susa, I thought of the many innocent people that were taken captive to Samaria and Israel. This was their very last act of atrocity. God was going to make an end to the cruelty of the Assyrians. He had hoped that the preaching of Jonah would have averted their punishment, but their repentance only lasted for a while. History tells us that there were three great warriors who defeated the Assyrians, Nabopolassa, along with his son Nebuchadnezzar, both of Babylon, and Seacheres, the median ruler of Ekbatana. The treaty signed between Esarhaddon, the Assyrian king, and the Medes a few years earlier did not prevent the destruction of Nineveh. The prophet Nahum predicted its fall and all the treaties of the world could not avert the destruction. And now for the fascinating biography of Nabu Kuduri Usr, also known in the Bible as Nebuchadnezzar. For 2,600 years, virtually all the knowledge about this man was obtained only from the Bible, the one source, and the writings of Josephus, the other source. But then in 1956, the Babylonian Chronicle was discovered, and what a discovery, describing the events of the first 11 years of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. In 605 BC, he defeated the Egyptians and the rest of the Syrian army at a place called Carchemish on the upper Euphrates River. I had the privilege of visiting this great historical battlefield at Carchemish, also called in modern Arabic Jarablus. Nebuchadnezzar then conquered the rest of Sarah Palestine and accepted the surrender of Jerusalem in 605 BC. He took some of the Jewish hostages to Babylon. Among them were Daniel and his three friends. The purpose of the king in taking the hostages to Babylon was to re-educate them to be Babylonian in their thinking. To help them think Babylonian, he even changed their names. If you break up Daniel's Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, you get three components. First one, Belet. This is the title of a Babylonian goddess. Shar, the word for king, and then the verb Usur, which means to protect. Literally, Daniel's Babylonian name means may the goddess Belet protect the king. That's the king Nebuchadnezzar. You see, the king of Babylon wanted to brainwash Daniel with this heathen name. 
The rebellious city of Jerusalem caused Nebuchadnezzar to punish it again in 596 BC. This time the prophet Ezekiel, along with 10,000 distinguished citizens, as well as King Jehoiakim, were taken captive to Babylon. Jerusalem was finally destroyed after a siege of two years in 586 BC. The Jews were victims of their own stubborn rebellion. But you know, God cares even about stubborn people and his love will persist in trying to make them kind and obedient. Come with me to the site of ancient Babylon. It was right here that God revealed his love for Jews and heathen in a very unique manner. The first major object that attracts one's attention as you approach the site is this huge painting of Saddam Hussein. This man regards himself as the new Nebuchadnezzar. Three horses are pursuing the enemy, which is Cyrus the Great. But he is also telling you and me that he now has more than just horses to keep you out of Iraq. He possesses an AK-47. His painting is erected on a very important historical site. The mound in the background is the place where Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace once stood. The name is Bab Ilu, and that means the gate of the god Ilu. This diagram of the city shows the location of both his southern and northern palaces. Let me tell you about a strange dream the king had right here at his northern palace. Daniel chapter 2 verse 1 says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. As I walked through the ancient Babylon, I thought of how the king ordered his wise men to tell him what he dreamt or die. A young Hebrew captive called Daniel asked the king for a little more time to recall and interpret the dream. In my imagination I see Daniel walking the procession way to the palace of the king. After he and his three friends prayed about the matter, God revealed the king's dream to Daniel. Let's listen to the conversation between the king and the young man Daniel. Daniel 2 verse 26 The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel surprised the king and everyone else when he said no. But there is a God in heaven who can. And then Daniel did the impossible. He told the king what he dreamt in his own bed, in his own palace, even when the king could not remember the dream. Verse 29 As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. When you study the political scene round about 603 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, you appreciate his fear about the future, like you and me also fear the future at times. Since 605 BC, when he conquered the Saro Palestine area, he had quite a job establishing his new kingdom. Although he defeated the Egyptian army of Pharaoh Necho previously, they were now preparing for another military onslaught. I had the privilege of visiting Nebuchadnezzar's throne room, which Saddam Hussein restored. You know, when I stood here, I thought of the loving and considerate God that we serve. God gave this unconverted heathen king a rundown of all the kingdoms from his time till the end of time. But he also gave the king the assurance of a future eternal peaceful kingdom where all tears will forever end. But God not only spoke to a cruel heathen Babylonian king 2,600 years ago, the dream has a message of hope for you and me who live in a time of fear and great political turmoil. 
While I stood here at Bab Ilu where the king had his dream, I thought of the very kind way in which God meets people where they are. The wicked king, this heathen Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream and a vision exactly like the Hebrew prophets of old had. We serve an inclusive God, not an exclusive God. Let's allow Daniel to continue interpreting the king's dream. Verse 31 says, You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. As Daniel describes the detail of the dream and the image, it all comes back to the king's mind. This is the very dream I had. Daniel continues. Verses 32 and 33 The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Now gold, silver, bronze and iron were a familiar sequence to the king. The Greek philosophers in his palace believed that life begins with gold, then you enter the youth of silver. Bronze belongs to the Middle Age people and iron to the Old Age. And then when you die, the cycle starts all over again. You begin with the precious gold of childhood and end in the not-too-precious iron of old age. This was all the ancient philosophers could offer. Birth and death, birth and death. Birth and death, at infinitum, nothing beyond, just an endless cycle of what? Well, of pain, disappointments, loss, and finally death. I told my daughter Loretta here that I'm not sure if I would be interested in having all the pain and disappointments of this life for a second and a third and a millionth time all over again. As we'll see in a moment, the different metals represent the rise and fall of kingdoms from the time of Nebuchadnezzar till our day. But it also represents the endless failures of humanity. Fortunately, God reveals to the king that he has something far more exciting in mind for his children than just an endless cycle of life and death. Listen to the ultimate and final extinction of human experiences of pain, disappointments and death. 34. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. What a friendly super rock. He's going to make an end to the human phenomenon of misery. How completely will sin and its results be eradicated? Daniel tells the king. Verse 35 Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. When God is going to clean up the human mess of pollution, you will not find a trace of it. The prophet Isaiah agrees with what Daniel says on this issue. Isaiah 65 verse 17 Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. My friend, you will not be able to remember the one who broke your heart. When God cleanses the earth, he will also clean up our bad memories. I'm looking forward to that glorious, happy day. What about you? I wish I had been in this Babylonian throne room when Daniel revealed the king's dream. Can you see that expression of amazement on the king's face? I'm sure he realized that God was speaking to him in a very special way. And I hope you too realize 
that God is speaking to you in a special manner right now. Daniel, says the king, please explain to me the meaning of this dream. Verses 37 and 38 You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. When you study Babylonian history, you'll appreciate the biblical reference to gold. Because the wealth of the ancient world was just pouring into this world metropolis. I think the king had a big smile on his face when Daniel accorded him the golden place in the image. When I visited the procession way on which the king used to walk on New Year's Day, I thought of the interpretation of the dream of the image. Daniel knew the Babylonian empire of gold would be replaced by an empire of silver. But if he tells this to the king, he may lose his life. But Daniel maintained a certain principle right through his life, and that was do what is right and leave the consequences to God. Listen to him. Verse 39. After you another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours, its chest and arms of silver. During our next lecture, we will spend more time on the fascinating story of the silver kingdom. This kingdom made its appearance upon the scene of ancient history at the exact time Daniel predicted it would. Next, a third kingdom of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Verse 40 Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for as iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. As the king listens to Daniel, he becomes more curious about the last part of his dream which mentions the feet of iron mixed with clay. They have come to the end of the image. What is going to happen next? Verse 44 In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. One wonders what Nebuchadnezzar thought of the statement that God's kingdom would endure forever. The Assyrian Empire before him did not endure forever. Presumably his kingdom would neither endure forever. As Daniel predicted that none of the kingdoms that would succeed him would continue forever. You are looking at a representation of the Babylonian god of Bel Marduk on the walls of the Ishtar Gate. He was one of many that the king worshipped, and now he hears of a god who transcends all Babylonian gods. Suddenly the truth of the god of heaven and earth, the truth about Daniel's saving god, grips the heart of the king, and this is how he reacts. Verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and order that an offering and incense be presented him. As I stood here, the ghostly image of the king came to my mind. Somewhere in this huge hall, the mighty king became so small in the presence of Daniel's God that he fell to the ground. As I stood here, I could identify with him. When we see how great God really is, and by contrast how small we really are, we too will want to fall on our knees and worship him. Verse 47 The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar's spiritual experience did not last and soon he did something very foolish. 
He built a very large copy of the very image of his dream. But instead of just a head of gold, it was all made of gold. There are two possible reasons why he erected this huge image of gold in Babylon in 593 BC. First, his initial conversion did not last too long. He rejected the prophecy that said another kingdom would succeed him. The other reason comes from a clay tablet that was translated and published in 1956. It tells of a serious mutiny that erupted in Nebuchadnezzar's army in December of 594 BC. Let me quote from this tablet. Quotes, it says, He slew many of his own army. His own hand captured his enemy. End of quotes. Perhaps his decision to summon the officials to the dedication of his image was triggered by this revolt. By the way, Jeremiah 51 verse 59 tells us that King Zedekiah of Judah also went to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, which coincides with the erection of the image on the plain of Dura in Babylon. Unfortunately, this backslidden king bowed before the image. The king ordered everyone to worship the image when they heard the sound of music. Everyone obeyed except Daniel's three friends. The king was furious. He gave them one more chance to bow down and worship the image when they heard the sound of music, listened to their polite but firm and assertive answer. Daniel chapter 3 verses 16 to 18 Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Three young men obeyed God and were cast into the fiery furnace. But to the amazement of the king, they didn't die. Instead, he saw a fourth person that looked like the Son of God. Verse 26 Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Whenever I visit the museum at Babylon and see the name of Nebuchadnezzar, I admire this man and thank God for not giving up on poor sinners like him and like me. The king had a second conversion. Listen to it. Verse 28 Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Every time I visit Babylon, I hope to hear of a discovery of a clay tablet telling of the final conversion of the mighty king Nebuchadnezzar. The entire chapter of Daniel chapter 4 is an autobiography of the great king written in 568 BC. He had ruled for 36 years. The wealth of the ancient world was pouring into Babylon. Nabopolassar, his father, only had one palace. Nebuchadnezzar built three. One of them was roofed with a garden of exotic trees and shrubs. He built it especially for his wife Amuhaya from Ekbatana. The palace of the hanging gardens was regarded as one of the seven wonders of antiquity. The desolate area you're looking at was called the Esagila. It had 53 temples, 
and 955 small sanctuaries and 384 street altars. The temple tower of Etamanonki rose to a height of 300 meters and was the most famous temple in the east. The city's outer walls were brick yellow in color. Its principal gates were glazed in blue. Its palaces were faced with rose-colored tiles and its myriad temples were gleaming white. But unfortunately, the king's might and power went to his head and he became cruel and unkind. He ignored Daniel's warnings to break with his sins. Twelve months later, he boasted. Daniel 4 verse 30 Is not this the great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? His megalomania caused him to become mentally deranged and for seven years he ate grass like cattle. This disease is called boanthropy, the ox syndrome. If you could turn the clock back to that time, you would see the king grazing over here. Next time you visit the British Museum, ask to see the clay tablet that mentions Nebuchadnezzar's madness. It was translated in 1975. It says that his life appeared of no value to him. He does not love son and daughter. Family and clan do not exist. You know, mad people don't care about others. Please avoid insanity by caring for others. I wished I could have witnessed his final conversion after seven years of mental derangement. God is extremely long-suffering with proud, selfish, cruel people. He wants them to change into kind and selfish people. And then one day, somewhere near the Euphrates River, the king responded to God's love. Listen to what happened. Verse 34 at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised and glorified him who lives forever. What a confession! What a conversion! What a man and what a God! Isn't it time that we get rid of our insanity with our own upward look? Perhaps it's time right now that we look to him and experience a transformation. I walked next to the huge walls of the restored Babylon and I prayed a similar prayer. Lord, please help me to always look up to you so that I may always have a kind heart and a sane mind. Daniel predicted that the breast and arms of silver would replace the head of gold. The manner in which this prophecy was fulfilled and the way Babylon fell is one of the most exciting stories of antiquity. Please don't miss the next lecture. Listen to these words while you're looking at the Median and Persian soldiers at Persepolis in Iran. The strength of nations, as of individuals, is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured by their fidelity with which they fulfill God's purpose. This comes from the book Prophets and Kings, page 502. God's purpose for you and me is to be kind to people around us. By His grace, I want to be that kind person. What about you? Let us ask God to take away our hearts of stone and give us kind, sympathetic hearts of flesh. These kindly subjects at which you are looking at bring their gifts to the Persian king. As I stood here I was thinking, you know God wants you and me to bring him a special gift. That gift is your heart and mine. What should we do? I think let's just give him our hearts. A 
trust you found this presentation as interesting as I did. I once again realized how true and exact God's word is. Let us pray. Dear Lord, my prayer is that we will daily appreciate your word more and more. And like the archaeologist that makes wonderful discoveries by exploring, may we also discover the loving God of the Bible who cares about sinners as we study your word. Amen. I encourage you to listen to the next prophecy concerning Cyrus the Great.